So I could imagine a CBT trial where we're uh, testing the effectiveness of, say, a new CBT model versus placebo on the burden of gastrointestinal symptoms. And I study uh, IBS, functional dyspepsia, these sort of non-organic type uh, gastrointestinal disorders. So we imagine that the dependent variable, the DV, is the gastrointestinal rating scale, the GSRS, and the independent variable, the IV, is active CBT versus placebo. And we've recruited 25 individuals into each arm of the trial. Our scientific hypothesis is that CBT will exhibit superior reduction or a greater reduction in GSRS scores compared with placebo. And therefore, our null hypothesis is that the mean response in placebo, mu CBT down here, is equal to that of the response in the placebo group. So our trial design looks like this. We have a population that we're sampling from, which are individuals in a community setting, perhaps, suffering from um, some functional gastrointestinal disorder like IBS. From that population, we draw a random sample and we randomly allocate this, uh, people in the sample to either the active CBT arm of our trial or the placebo arm. And we record uh, the uh, symptom scores, the GSRS scores in both these groups, both at baseline or pre-treatment and then at the end of treatment. And it's the change score, the difference between these two pre and post scores, which forms our dependent variable. So that's our trial layout. Our results might look something like this. So here we have an error bar plot where we have on the horizontal axis, CBT and placebo groups, and on the vertical axis, the change in their gastrointestinal symptom rating scores. Uh, this little diamond here is the mean response in, in CBT. This circle is the mean response in placebo. And I can see visually that the mean response in CBT is more negative, is stronger than placebo. But I can also see that the mean for CBT, the CBT group lies just inside the 95% confidence interval for placebo and vice versa which would suggest that I cannot rule out random chance uh, from playing a role here. And these error bars are 95% confidence intervals. I can calculate Cohen's D to be 0 0.29, which is in the small range. And the p-value from the unpaired t-test is 0 0.3. I'm therefore going to uh, accept H0 and conclude that while there is some improvement, some benefit of CPT over placebo, it's not large enough or not clear enough really for me to reject H0 and conclude that CBT is clearly superior to placebo. But let's suppose though that we had some more resources and some more time and we were able to keep recruiting uh, individuals into the study or to conduct a number of larger sample size studies. what happens to um, uh, my t-test as the sample size increases? Well, what I've done here is to uh, conduct a further four simulated studies. So uh, as though I'd gone out and obtained four more samples, randomized people the same way, uh, taking the same measurements uh, before and after therapy, and I'm repeating my, uh, my um, error bar plots here and my t-tests. In the top left here, the sample size was 35 per arm. And I can see that Cohen's D is very similar to my original study at 0.21, so quite small. Um, and the p-value is still uh, clearly non-significant. It's actually slightly less significant uh, than the original study. And that may be in part because Cohen's D is a little bit smaller. On the right here, I've conducted a third study with a sample size of 50 individuals per arm. Cohen's D is again 0.21, and the p-value is still not significant, but at 0 0.28, it is smaller than the p-value from the n equals 35 per arm study. 
So nothing has happened to the numerator, but the denominator of the t-test has become smaller because of the larger sample size, resulting in a smaller p-value. I now conduct a full study, but now with 100 individuals per arm. By sheer random chance, Cohen's D this time is a bit smaller. It's at 0.18 compared with 0.21, but the p-value is also smaller at 0.19. So despite the numerator getting a little bit smaller, the p-value has decreased because of the doubling of sample size. And then finally, I conduct a very large study with 200 individuals per arm. Cohen's D is minus 2.0, so quite similar to my third and fourth studies. But the p-value is finally is 0.05, right on that magic threshold of significance. And so the again, the numerator hasn't changed, but the denominator has become so small, the uncertainty has become so small, that I can just about conclude that I should reject H0. And that also holds up visually. I can see here that the mean reduction in the placebo group lies outside the 95% confidence interval for CBT and indeed vice versa. So let's try to generalize these findings from these particular sample sizes and this particular study to the more general effect of increasing sample size on the probability of rejecting H0 and how that concords or does not concord with sensible scientific practice. So in these two graphs, I'm looking at what happens as we increase sample size on the horizontal axis to first of all the standard error, and bear in mind that the standard error is the denominator of the t-ratio. The numerator is the difference between means. The denominator is the standard error, which measures the uncertainty around that numerator. And I can see that as the sample size increases from small values like 25 up to large values like 250, that the standard error reduces by almost fourfold over that range. So that reduces the uncertainty around the difference in means quite substantially. And this corresponding effect that has on the value of t is to increase from just over 2 to almost 8 over the same range. So, so this t ratio increases by almost four, um, fourfold over that range. But the fact that the t ratio is larger does not make the... Um, clinical or scientific significance of our findings any greater. It just reduces the uncertainty. So what have we learned from this discussion? Well, we've learned that uh, the effect size remain substantially unchanged at around 0 0.2 across all the simulated experiments that I presented, and that increasing the sample size reduced the size of the error bars or the standard error, which corresponds to reduced uncertainty around the sample estimate of the difference between CBT and placebo. However, being confident that a small effect size is not due to random chance, to random sampling variability, does not actually make it any more clinically or scientifically relevant. So if we conclude that CBT, inverted commas, works based on these data, these large sample size type data, will make a, a logical, if not a statistical, type 1 error. Because we will conclude that CBT works, even though the effect size is too small to have any real relevance. And the take-home message from this exercise is that when we consider results of our studies, we need to consider both the effect size through a measure like Cohen's D, but there are, of course, numerous measures of, of effect size, in combination with the p-value to interpret both the clinical or scientific significance in combination with the statistical significance.